So let's begin with the psychology. Today I'm going to talk about what psychology is and then we're going to talk about some methodologies used in psychology. What is psychology? If you look at any of the textbooks in psychology or if you Google or if you use Wikipedia, probably what you can find on about the definition of a psychology is the scientific study of human behavior. Okay. Probably this is the standard correct answer. But I want to redefine psychology in this way. In addition to psychology, every discipline, okay, physics, chemistry, political science, sociology, whatever science you can think of, the reason why they exist is because people want to know why. Why what? Why this? This dress was quite popular. It went viral sometime last year. But why people were curious about this picture? Because the same picture, some people, they find it blue and black. Some people find it white and kind of golden. Let's do a brief, uh, simple survey. How many of you think this dress is blue and black? Put on your hands. Okay, more than half. How many of you think this dress is white and golden? Okay, not too much. So mo the majority of people think this is blue and black. This picture, this dress, it was very surprising. The reason people find it interesting is because it is counterintuitive. Because we, most of us, have an assumption. Everyone should see the same thing. But this assumption might not be correct. Because we have an assumption, the same dress, supposedly, everyone should see the, should see the same color. But how come if people see different colors? So it, it is really surprising. It is really interesting. And also, it was the reason why this, pop, this picture went viral last year. Not only on Facebook, but in magazines. Also in international conferences about psychology and perception, perceptual psychology. People were really in, very kind of surprised by the result. But if you think about why people get surprised, because people have an assumption that everyone should see the same thing, but this assumption may not be correct. You can, you can imagine that if you, had, if you have, have a dog, just imagine you have a dog, and if the same dress if your dog can talk, do you think that your dog will see the same colors as you do? Probably most of you will think, no, probably because it is a dog. The dog has different eyes. The dog has different perceptual system. And the dog can see some lights that human beings can't see. So supposedly a dog should see something different from a human does. It is, not too, it is not too surprising that a dog will see different things from you do. But if you are not too surprised by the dog seeing different things, why do you have to be surprised? Why are you surprised by other people seeing different things? Other people, although they are human beings, but they have, their, they have a different brain. Their brain is not your brain. Their perceptual system is not your perceptual system. And you don't have the, exactly the same DNA, DNA as they do. So how would you assume that they should see the same thing as you do? So people see different things. The fact that the same stimulus, the same object, object but people see differently, it actually is, it is not too surprising. If you really think about it, it, it is not too surprising. But still, people are really intrigued by why people see the same thing differently. This is also a topic that psychologists are interested in. And this, there is a psychological disorder called 
anorexia nervosa. Okay, 中中文翻译是厌食症了、啊、哈。The symptoms are those people they can't taking any food. Okay, it could be quite dangerous because if you don't eat any food, your body doesn't have enough nutrition and you could die. So it's quite dangerous. There are A lot of different potential reason why people develop anorexia nervosa, but the major reason, one of the major reasons, is those people, those patients, they have issues with their own body image. Like this girl, as you can see from here, she has been quite skinny already and even bony. But when whenever she looks at herself in the mirror, she always thinks that there's a fat woman in the mirror. And she doesn't want to get fat. She she doesn't want to become a fat woman. So that's why she doesn't eat, and the consequence could be fatal. But why? Why does this kind of symptom happen? And how should we do to fix this problem? Because it's getting quite popular now. Not only for females nowadays, for men, there are also like the difference between men and women are kind of decreasing now about this issue. This hypnosis, okay, I just described about hypnosis、um, earlier in this class. When people think about hypnosis, people think about there is a kind of kind of、um, hypnotizer, hypnotist, and hypnotist will say something like, "Whenever you hear this, you become a dog." And as you can see from the from those TV shows, those people, whenever they hear this, they do become dogs. Are they real or not? Actually. Hypnosis is really used in clinical clinical psychology. Okay, in the clinical field, some therapists they do use hypnosis as a technique to fix some psychological problems. But probably their hypnosis used in clinical psychology is not as miraculous as fantastic like kind of kind of. Interesting, as you see from those TV shows. Okay. So whether it's real or unreal, and this probably is more kind of relevant to our to our kind of daily life or current affairs. Even now, twenty first century, there still are some very radical. Could be religious, could be political groups in the world, and they do a lot of political, a lot of radical things. Okay, why? I mean, why do those people want to become part of those groups?、Okay. And if you don't look at, and if you look at the human history, this kind of things is it has happened many, many times. We got two world wars in the last century. Okay, in addition to those two world wars, there have been quite a lot of different. Wars or massacres in human human history. Why? Why? Why did it happen? How come people would do that kind of things? It is because they were born to be evil, or there are something else. And if you were them, do you think you were still you would still be as kind as you are now? If you were in that kind of radical group, okay. This kind of issue is also an an issue that psychologists are kind of want to know about because of those strange phenom human phenomena. So people have been using different methods trying to know why why those strange things happened. When whenever you want to know why, you have, you will try to do something to find the answer. Why? Have people been using to find the answers? Like this, this is one of the method people use to find the answer, like fortune fortune telling. Okay, you might see a, a person using crystal ball and trying to find out why a person, why other people behave that way, or astrology, star signs. Why is that person that so mean? So mean to me? Probably because my star sign. And his his star sign are not compatible. Why is my boss so stingy? Probably because my boss is 
a particular star sign. This is one of the methods people use to find out the cause of human behavior. Okay. And this phrenology, okay. phrenology probably most of you are not that familiar with this term, but it is actually quite, you can find this phrenology in, probably in every psych psychology textbook. Phrenology is a kind of technique that people try to know other people's behavior by the shape of their skull. Okay. There is an assumption in phrenology. The assumption is every human behavior is relevant to the shape of your skull. For example, this is your, the shape of your skull. This region, probably this region has something to do with your uh, intelligence, just uh, for example. And this region has something to do with your music talent. And this region is, has something to do with how, how probably how artistic you are. Okay. And probably this, re this region is, has something to do with how sociable you are. Okay. They had assumption every human trait could be somehow relevant to a particular region on your skull. Okay. This kind of technique is called or this kind of knowledge system is called phrenology. F like nowadays, when people talk about phren phrenology, people, people might think it's ridiculous. Okay. But actually, even for nowadays, there we are, actually it's for psychologists. Some, most of us, most of us, uh, most of the psychologists, actually we are not doing something too different from phrenology. But the only thing different is probably in the past they look at the skull, but nowadays people look at the you know, deep inside of your skull, which is your brain. Okay. Of course, brain is important. If you don't have brain, you wouldn't have any behavior at all, of course. So brain is necessary for human behavior. But people have a, an assumption that our brain is something like this. A particular region in your brain has something to do with your language. Another region of your brain has something to do with, with your, um, probably your social intelligence. And there's still another region of your brain has something to do with how social level you are, something like that. But this kind of assumption may or may not be true. Okay? Probably the other possibility is your whole brain is doing the language. Your whole brain is doing music. Your whole brain is doing how sociable you are. But they are not really that localized. But most of the psychologists nowadays, we all have this kind of assumption that every human behavior is somehow localized to somewhere in your brain. Okay. So this is phonology. Probably in the 19th century, there was a group of people, they thought now, we could study physics, we could study chemistry in scientific methods. Why don't we study human behavior with scientific methods? So about that time, 19th century, people started to use, try to use science to study human behavior. Okay, until today. So today, if you take any psychology course in any of the universities in the world, that psychology you will learn is the scientific psychology. Okay? Which means that you have to use scientific method to study human mind. Okay? This is a very important historical event in the history of psychology. In 1879, there was a guy, him, Wilhelm Wundt. He was a German. Okay. He established, so far, ever recorded the first laboratory of psychology okay, in the University of Leipzig in Germany. Okay. So it's, it could be a turning point that psychology officially entered the field of science. Okay. This is a crucial historical point. When people talk
talk about science. Okay, so so yeah, therefore, therefore psychology nowadays examines human behavior through scientific method. Some people might be sus kind of skeptical about this. Do can we really do science on psychology? Okay. Because when we are talking about science, a very important characteristic about science is you have to quantify the thing you want to measure. Like the numbers are quite important in science. But psychology, somehow there are some psychological things which are really hard to be quantified. For example, if you want to study creativity, how would you quantify creativity? Okay. Or if you want to study love, right? love is a word that we use almost very often. You can see this kind of word in every pop songs or movies. So love is a very important psychological phenomenon. But if you are a love researcher, and if, if you want to do science, of course, you have to try to find a way to quantify love. But is it possible? Actually, this is another topic. Okay, but if you want to treat psychology as a science, this is something you have to do. You have to quantify it. No matter what, you, what kind of topic you study. You study love, you study creativity, whatever you study, you have to quantify it. This is what now, like psychologists do nowadays. So you or, other, or some other people might be skeptical about this. Okay. Is it a good method to study human behavior? It could be good, it could be bad, but it's another topic. It's beyond the scope of this course. If you're into this kind of topic, probably you have to study some philosophy books or take some philosophy courses, but it's not what covered in this course. Basically, what I'm going to do in this course is to introduce you what contemporary psychologists do. Okay. So from now on, in the next few weeks, in the next few months, what we are, what I'm going to show you is the scientific study of human behavior. They might be correct or they might be good, but it's a way, it's a method that people do. Okay. So science. Okay. So when people talk about science, probably different like everyone has a different definition about what science should be, but this is my way of illustrating what science is. If you want to do science, firstly, you have to form a, a hypothesis. Okay, you have to have a hypothesis first, and then you have to test, test your hypothesis. But how do you test your hypothesis? As I just said, in science, a very important thing is you have to quantify everything. So you have to collect the data, and you have to analyze the data okay. and then you have to explain your data and then after you have explained your data you have to draw a conclusion this is a, what, a very typical way of doing science okay. this is also a very typical way that psychologists nowadays do okay. probably it would be it would be too abstract if i i only talked about the concept let's have a an concrete example Let's assume that you are an educational psychologist. Okay? You are doing education and you are a psychologist. And you are concerned with aggressive TV shows. You've, you have found that nowadays you can find, you can easily find aggressive TV shows, aggressive movies, aggressive TV games, aggressive everything online. And you are concerned that those aggressive materials will affect teenagers or school children and you want to do something to try to fix this issue and you are a psychologist and you have been trained to be a psychologist and those training tells you that whenever you want to do something whenever you want to say something you have to provide concrete evidence because as I just said psychology nowadays we treat it as a science so whatever you say you need evidence which is quite important. How could you provide the evidence? Okay. Before you start to collect data, th this is the first difficulty. This, this is the first problem you come across. 
there is something called observer bias. What is observer bias? For example, you want to know whether a violent TV show will increase aggressive behavior. Okay, the first thing you have to do is to quantify violent TV shows and aggressive behavior. But how, did, how would you quantify it? Another thing is the same behavior. You might find it aggressive, but other people might find it not that aggressive. People have different tolerance of aggression. People have different criteria for aggression. This is called observer bias because t aggression, everyone knows what aggression is, but every, everyone has a different, different definition about aggression. So everyone has a different observer bias. And how could you fix this observer bias? In psychology, the method we use to fix this observer bias is to use operational definitions. And what is an operational definition? An operational definition is a definition that could be boiled down to specific procedures. For example, hunger, if you want to know how hunger affects your learning efficiency. But people have different definition about hunger. So to fix this, you try to operationally define hunger. And this is one of the ways that you can use. You define hunger as the physical and mental status after 42 day fasting. Fasting So if you don't take in any food for 48 hours, then that kind of mental and physical status, you define it as hunger. Because two day fasting is something you can, something doable, something you can treat as a procedure and something other people can do the same thing as well. So this kind of thing, we can call it an operational definition. But some other people, they might be skeptical about the operational definition. What if, if some person after Okay, according to this definition, it has to be 48 hours fasting. What about 47 hour fasting? Is it counted as hunger? Of course, this is a, an issue that if you use operational definition, there will be some, you will come across some, you know, some kind of gray area, okay, you, it's re, which is re, very hard to define. But there's no other better strategy. If you want to do science, you have to really quantify everything. And you have to quantify things in an operational definition way. Okay. So for aggression, how do you operation, operationally define aggression? It's a very hard issue. But a possible way is probably if you, for example, if you define aggression as something like over the past month, and if you did anything that caused any uncomfortable feelings for other people, then you define it as an aggression. This is one of possible way to define um, aggression. But, but anyway, to the same topic, to the same concept, concept, people, different researchers might have different operational definition to the same concept. concept. So when you are doing a research project, when you are writing a research paper, a very important thing is you have to clearly define your concept and you have to define your concept in an operational way. Okay, so this is operational definition. So for your assignment, okay, if you are choosing, for example, if you want to study intelligence as your assignment, and if you are reading those papers that I'm going to assign, you have to really look at did those authors they use a clear operational definition to define intelligence because intelligence is also a very abstract concept so you have to like as a researcher re you do really need to define intelligence when, before you mention about your experiments but not every researcher is, is, is very serious about this so when you are reading those papers you can try to f look for their operational definitions whether they clearly defined their concepts or not. 
and this is very important about a research paper. Okay, so after you have operationally defined the concepts you want to study, the next thing you have to do is to collect data. How do psychologists collect data? There are many different ways. There are many different methods. I'm going to only talk about two of them. The first one, experimental method. The second one, correlational method. Okay. What are they? An experimental method is a method that people use to manipulate the independent variable to see how it affects the dependent variable. What is an independent variable and what is a dependent variable? Let's just take the violent TV show as an example. If you are an educational psychologist and if you want to know whether violent TV show will cause aggressive behavior okay so in this hypothesis this is the cause this is the effect in an experiment what you have to do is to manipulate the cause which is also the independent variable independent the effect is the dependent variable and you have to manipulate manipulate what is manipulation okay. when we are like in a day-to-day -day life when we are talking about manipulation it doesn't sound good someone is manipulative what is manipulative it means that someone has been trained to control or change other people okay. the same definition for manipulation is also used in psychology when you are manipulating something, you are controlling or you are changing other people's behaviors or thoughts. Okay. So in manipulation, manipulating, it is the researcher or you okay, who controls the subject's certain behavior instead of the subject controlling him or herself. That is manipulation. Okay. In the example of TV, like violent TV shows and aggressive behavior, what you have to do is you have to set up two groups. Okay. The first one is called experimental group. The second one is control group. For experimental group, those people, they have to watch violent TV shows. They can't choose. If they sign up for your experiment, then you have to force them to go to this group. So this is why, this is how you manipulating them because it is your responsibility to change their behavior. So you are manipulating them. You are controlling their TV watching behavior. You are asking them to go to this group. You are manipulating them. Okay. And for the other half of the participants, they have to watch something else, anything else, but not aggressive. And this is the control group. Okay. And then you have to recruit research participants. So you've got subject one, S1, subject one. Okay. The subject one comes to your lab and which group does he have to go to? It, okay, the best way to do an experiment is to do random assignment. It is not you or it is not himself to decide which one to go to. It is the randomness to decide which group he has to go to. What is the randomness? Maybe you can roll a dice. Okay. You have anyway which which group he has to go to has to be determined by random. 
It can't be deci decided by any, particularly it can't be decided by himself. Okay. So you might roll the dice, or you can ask him to roll a dice and to choose to go to each of the groups. Maybe after rolling the dice, he has to go to the experimental group. And then the subject two comes. Also, he has to roll the dice. And then he has to go to the, also, uh, the experimental group. And then the third subject comes, who has been, uh, who is assigned to the uh, control group, and so on and so forth. And you have six participants. Three of them are in the experimental group, and three of them are in the control group. And then they will start watching TV shows. These three guys, they are watching violent TV shows probably three hours a day for seven days. Okay, so they are, they are being manipulated. Okay, and the other three people, they are watching probably just discovery shows for three hours a day for seven days. Okay, so this process is called manipulating. And after one week, you try to assess their aggressive behavior. Probably you can design a questionnaire. And in this questionnaire, if, you, if someone gets a high score, that person is aggressive. If someone gets a low score, then he, he's, he's not that aggressive. And eventually, you do find that the experimental group, they are more aggressive than the other group. And there you can draw a conclusion. Yes, violent TV shows will increase your aggressive behavior. This is an experiment. Okay. The most important thing is the cause, the independent variable, how many TV shows they watch, has to be controlled, has to be manipulated. They can't decide how many TV shows they want to watch. This is, is an experiment. Okay. Also, a random assignment is important. Which people which person goes to which group has to be determined by randomness. This is quite important. Of course, you will see this kind of questions in your midterm exam. Okay. And also, when you are doing your assignment, uh, you have to read the paper first. Probably most of the papers, they would use an experimental method, you have to really look at do they use the experiment method properly? Do they really do random assignment? Do they really manipulate the independent variable? This is important. But in psychology, there is some annoying thing called confounding variable. Okay? Psychologists love it and hate it. Why? Because, for example, if you are the educational psychologist and you do find that aggressive violent TV shows do increase aggressive behavior, another psychologist might argue with you. The other psychologist may, may say, okay, actually, although you, you, f you have found the difference, but the difference could be due to something other than aggression. It could be because, you know, when you look at those violent TV shows. Usually, violent TV shows are more, probably, they are, okay, maybe they, they are, they're, there's more, more radiation, or maybe those sounds are louder. It is because those radiation, it is because those louder sounds that increase your aggressive behavior, rather than the violent component in the TV shows that increase your violent aggressive behavior. This is called a confounding variable. You thought you have successfully manipulated something, but you accidentally manipulated some other stuff. And it is the other stuff that causes the result, instead of the thing that you want to manipulate that caused your result. This is called confounding variable. Okay. The reason why psychologists love it is because whenever you find a paper, and you can actually not, it doesn't have to be a psychologist. Any one of you can easily find a confounding variable from a research academic paper. It's not hard, particularly for social psychology. Okay. So why psychologists love it? Because you can easily argue with other people. And you can easily set up, set out a new research project trying to attack other people. The reason why they, still, they also hate it because you don't want other people to use confounding variable to attack you. 
Okay, so this is why psychologists love it and hate it. And in an experiment design, there are two kinds of design. It could be a between subject design or within subject design. Between subject design is a design that I just talked about. You have two groups and each person is assigned to one of the group. Okay, this is a between subject design. But in some cases, you might use within subject design. Within, within subject design is a design that every subject has to undergo every condition. For example, if you want to compare the difference between violent TV show and non-violent TV show, each of the subjects, they have to watch both violent TV shows and non-violent TV shows. Okay. For example, subject comes to the lab and the subject one, he watches violent TV show for one week and then you assess his uh, aggressive behavior and then after another week he watches non-violent TV shows and you are uh, assessing his aggressive behavior so he basically he has been through two conditions and you compare the difference between the two that kind of design is called a within subject design okay you in most of the cases Within subject design, you can get more stable data. And for between subject design, usually the data are more noisy. The reason why it is noisy is more kind of chaotic. It is because if you compare the experimental group and the control group, of course they are different. But one of the reasons they are different is because, of course, they are different people. So of course they behave different. Okay. So usually, because they are the data from uh, between subject design, they are from different people, so usually their data are not that stable. Okay. But within subject design, although it's the data are usually more stable, but the thing is, there are some topics you just can't use a within subject design. For example, what if the effect of a violent TV show is long? Okay. Probably, violent, if, it's possible that once you have watched a violent TV show, it will cause a permanent effect. Okay. If something can cause a, cause a permanent effect, of course you can't use it within subject design. Because, because once someone has watched a violent TV show, he will become violent like for the rest of his life, for example. So of course you can't ask him to come back to the control group again. So there are some topics you just can't use within subject design. Okay, so these are the advantages and disadvantages of the experimental method. The advantages is, okay, uh, the call session is mostly guaranteed. If you want to draw any causal relationship between the cause and the effect, usually uh, experimental design is better. But there are still disadvantages. The first one, too artificial. Okay, because the subject has to come to a lab and the subject knows that he's participating in research. So for him, he might, re he might not react naturally because the whole context is too artificial. The second one, participants usually know what you are doing. And for most of the participants, they will try to collaborate with you. Okay? They will try to... Because you, you can imagine that, that kind of scenario. You stand up for an experiment and you, you got paid. So when you go to the lab, suppose that you would start to guess what that researcher is doing. And you would guess his motivation. You would guess his purpose. And usually you would try to do something to, to get the result that he wants. Okay? Because most of us are nice people. So we want to help other people, including the researcher. Okay? The other one, ethical issue. Why could there be an ethical issue? Uh, what ethical issue could be a concern is what if you are not studying the violent TV show and aggressive behavior? If, what if you want to study something called gender? Whether gender could affect your aggressive behavior. What is, a, what is gender? Male or female? Okay. If you want to study this issue, whether gender could cause or could affect uh, aggressive behavior. Supposedly, what you have to do is to manipulate the gender. How do you do to manipulate gender? 
the subject one comes, this person, you don't know whether it's a guy or a girl, this, their gender is manipulated by you instead of themselves. He, this person, they should roll a dice and eventually you, you get a male result. So this person, they have to go to the male group. Okay, they have to be manipulated into a male. And the second person has to be manipulated to a, a male. The third person has to be manipulated to a female. Okay. So if you want to use an experiment to study how gender affects aggressive behavior, this is what you have to do. You have to manipulate their gender. But of course, you can't do this. And what should you do? Not only gender. If you want to know whether race could be an issue, whether cultural background could be an issue, whether social economic status could be an issue, you can't do an experiment because you, because you can't manipulate gender, you can't manipulate race, you can't manipulate cultural background. So what you have to do is to choose the second best strategy. The second best strategy is correlational method. Okay. Correlational method is something you can't manipulate. Then you, what you have to do is just passively record those variables. So when the subject one comes to your lab, subject one will tell you, okay, how many TV shows that I have, I have watched over the past few weeks. And then subject one has to fill out a questionnaire to assess his aggressive behavior and he, get, he gets a score. The score is X1. His aggressive level is X1. Okay. So this is the results for subject one. And then subject two. Subject two, he tells you that he doesn't watch any violent TV show. So this number is zero. And also you also give him a questionnaire to assess his aggressive level and the result is X2. Okay. So you got another two numbers and so on and so forth. You get, probably you get a hundred subjects. So you get a hundred frequencies of uh, violent TV show watching. You get a hundred scores of uh, aggressive levels. And then you do statistics. You calculate their correlation coefficient, and it ranges from minus one to plus one. Okay. Supposedly, you, prob you should have learned a little bit about correlation coefficient in your high school, descriptive statistics. Basically, for correlation coefficient, you are trying to find the relationship between two variables. For example, your weight and your height. If you plot your weight and your height, supposedly there should be a positive relationship. The higher, the taller you are, the heavier you are. That is called a positive correlation. Same here. If you plot your violent TV show watching frequency and your aggressiveness, if you get a result like this, it means that the more violent TV shows you watch, the more aggressive you are. That is a positive correlation. Okay. Or you could get an opposite result. The more t violent TV shows you watch, the less aggressive you are. This is called a negative correlation. There could be another alternative. You might get a zero correlation. A zero correlation means that the dots are scattering everywhere in this plot. So there isn't any systematic relationship between violent TV show watching and aggressive behavior. In that case, it is a zero correlation. Something you have to really keep in mind is even if you have found a positive correlation, the more violent TV shows you watch, the more aggressive you are, even you have found a positive correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean there is a causal relationship. What is a causal relationship? A causal relationship means violent TV show will increase aggressiveness. In this case, you can't use increase. Because when you say increase, it means there's a causal relationship. But 
Suppose, suppose this is just a correlation because it could be the other way around. It could be because you are ag more aggressive already. You are aggressive already. So of course you would, you would tend to choose violent TV shows to watch. So it is not that violent TV show that increases your behavior, but your aggressiveness affects what kind of TV show you watch. So it could be this is the cause, this is the effect, or it could be this is the cause, this is the effect. You don't know whether which one is the cause, which one is the effect. Or another possibility is neither of them is the cause. There is some other thing which serves as the cause. They are both effects. What does it mean? It could be because, let's assume these are the results from school children. Okay? The cause could be their parents. The reason why there is a positive correlation, it is because for those aggressive parents, they tend to watch more violent TV shows. So of course, the, when their parents are watching, those children are watching with them. And it is because those parents are more uh, violent. So they tend, so of course, when the parents are more violent, the children will become more aggressive. So both of the two variables could be just effects. There is another un, the invisible cause, but you don't know. Okay. So this is something very important. If you are using a correlational method, you can't draw any causative conclusion. Okay, in your conclusion, you can't draw any causal relationship in your conclusion. Okay, so correlation does not guarantee causation. If there is a correlation between A and B, it could be A leads to B, B leads to A, it could be C leads to both A and B. Another example, during, during rainy days, okay, usually the floor is wet. Okay. And during rainy days, the traffic is worse. There, there will be more traffic jams. So if you calculate the correlation between traffic jams and how wet the floor is, there is a positive correlation. But it, it doesn't mean that the humidity of the floor that causes traffic jams. The invisible cause is the rain. It is the rain that causes the wetness of the floor. It is the rain that causes the traffic jams. Okay. So if you find a correlation between two, you can't draw any causal relationship. Okay. So this is something very important in psychology because in psychology it's really unavoidable that sometimes there are some issues. There are some issues that you just can't use an experiment. You you could only use a correlational method. But if you use a correlational method, what you can say is not that. I mean, you can't make a very strong point. Okay, but this is something like psychologists have to face. This is also something when you are reading a psychological article, a research article, or any article you find on any of the magazines or on Facebook, you have to be cautious. If that research project is using a correlational method, you have to be cautious whether that author, whether his point is too strong or not. Okay. So let's have some exercise about the difference between an experiment and a correlational method. The first one, in order to know whether music can increase intelligence, Dr. Lee recruits a group of people and records their IQ and their music skill. And this doctor has found there is some kind of relationship between the two variables. Do you think it is an experiment or it's just a correlational uh, method? Okay, yes, it's a correlational method. Okay. Because in this case, Dr. Lee, he doesn't manipulate anything. He just passively records the IQ and the music skills. Okay. There isn't any manipulation going on here. So in this case, even if you, even you find a correlation between the two, positive correlation between the two, you can't say that music can increase your IQ. It could be 
your IQ that increase your music skill learning. Or it could be because those people, they are just richer. So of course, for rich people, they have more resources. So probably if they do an intelligent test, they tend to get higher scores. And also they have more time and money to learn a music uh, instruments. So it could be an another factor, which is the how rich you are that leads to this correlation. Okay. The second one, Dr. Chen wants to know the relationship between meditation and sleeping quality. So he recruits a group of people and randomly assigns them into the meditation group and non-meditation group to see how their sleeping quality is. And if Dr. Chen does find that the meditation group, they sleep better than the non-meditation group. Okay. In this example, what method does Dr. Chen use? Okay. Experiment or correlational method? Okay. Yes, the, the correct answer is experiment. Because this, there is a manipulation, half of the people, they have to meditate okay, for probably one week or something. And the other, the other group, they can do anything else other than meditation. So you are actually changing, you are actually manipulating their behavior. Okay. The next one. A study shows that the crime rate is higher in the regions where immigrants are aggregated. Okay. So this is a correlational method or an experiment. Okay, thank you. Yes, it is a correlation. Okay. Because you are not manipulating whether a person is immigrant or not. You are not manipulating the crime rate either. And also, even if you find there is a correlation between the numbers of immigrants and the number of crime rate, for example, it could be because the rent. Usually in a city, those regions where immigrants are aggregated, the, the rent for those regions are cheaper. And usually for, probably for uh, like lower rent regions, their crime rate tends to be higher. So it could be the rent which causes both of the two, instead of them having causal relationship. Okay. The next one. A study shows that boys are better at spatial intelligence, whereas girls are better at speech intelligence. Do you think it's an experiment or a correlational method? Yes, it is a correlational method. So this is something you have to be cautious. Whenever you come across this kind of findings, like gender, race, cultural background, it can't be experiment. <laughs> it, it has to be a like, correlation. And when it is a correlational method. You have to be cautious about the conclusion, okay? Because it doesn't guarantee any causal relationship. Okay, so let's go back to science. Nowadays, people treat psychology as a science. As a science, what a psychology does is to form a hypothesis and to test hypothesis. And the way, the method people use to test hypothesis are, could be experimental method or could be correlational method. After, after you have finished collecting the data, the next thing is you have to analyze your data. Okay? What kind of methods do people do to analyze the data? Statistics. Okay. So in this course, we, it, it is, this course doesn't cover statistics, but if you are a psychology student, okay, for psychology students, statistics is quite important. It's a very important course for psychology uh, students because you know, psychology is a science and we collect data. And you, you, as you, you can usually, for most of the data that psychologists collect, collect those data are quite messy. And to fix those messy data, you have to use very fancy statistical methods. But it is not covered in this course. After you have analyzed the data, you have to interpret your data. Okay? You have to give a conclusion about your data in logical ways. Logic is also important for psychologists. Okay? But today, we don't have time to talk about logics. We are going to talk about logic next week. So next week we will talk about some logical fallacy that commonly seen in psychological studies.